Welcome back. Welcome back. Well, it's tennis time, the tennis season. There are just two weeks until the Wimbledon tennis tournament. One man to look out for is the Argentine star, Juan Martín del Potro. Two years ago, as an underdog, aged just 20, he won the US Open, becoming the only player to beat both Rafa Nadal and Roger Federer in the same Grand Slam tournament. And in this particular one, in fact, he went on to beat Roger Federer in the final. But last season, he barely played following a wrist injury which threatened his career. He slipped from fourth in the world to 485th. Well, now he's back, fully fit and flying up the rankings. Um, I met him at the Aegon Championships at Queen's Club in London to see, uh, see how he's getting on. I watched the... Whole, the whole of your victory at the US Open in 2009. That was a fantastic performance, and uh, as of now, presumably the thing you're most proud of at the moment. Yeah, yeah it was uh, a complete dream for me. Beat Russia in my first Grand Slam final in five sets in New York. Uh, I think the match was really, really nice to, to see. The crown was really really happy for the match for the for the fight together and for me it was my best match ever yeah absolutely. absolutely and how how soon after that was the when you got the wrist injury well the, the wrist problem was uh, last year in 2010 right. in the beginning of the year after australia i started to felt uh, some problems on the wrist and nobody find the dianist and um, after three months I came to to United States on Mayo Clinic and a doctor uh, said to me you have to to make a surgery because the bone is split and we need to to fix to fix it and well I made the surgery in May of two thousand and ten and after five or six months I was playing again. Five or six months, it's quite a time. During that time, is it always the case when fitness is so important, do you sometimes, at the time like that, worry and think, you know, will I ever be able to play again? You know? yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I was really sad uh, yeah. with my friends, with my family. They are helped me a lot. But uh, nobody say to me you can you will play again in good level or or healthy I, I made a good treatment with the psychology with the physios with the trainer and and after six months I was ready to play but I don't feel I'm still feeling a scar with my grace so I, I, I decide to to stop for the year and start 2011 hundred percent and so now you've got to get back you were number four before this happened weren't you in the world and uh, and then recently you were 485 485 and then and now you're back to in the 20s aren't you so how long do you think it will take you to get back to number four <laughs> I don't <laughs> know um, I hope very very soon I'm trying to to recover my game, yeah. to, to learn in, on grass court, uh, I'm, I'm improving my game day by day. I already won two tournaments this year, and maybe if I have a good summer in the United States, I can be top ten very soon. That's exciting. How long? How long is a, these days? How long do you see a tennis player's life lasting? I mean. Beyond thirty, beyond thirty-five. I don't know. I'm, I am still young. I'm only twenty-two, but uh, with my with my physical problems, maybe my career will be short than Rafa, Djokovic, or Federer. But I would like to play until thirty years uh, yeah. at least. Do you think the tennis season is too long now? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Every player uh, thinks the, the 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 season is very long. We play many tournaments in 
in many weeks uh, we already finished in French Open and yeah. next Monday we are playing on grass and we have uh, a next Grand Slam in two weeks so it's very it's, it's very dangerous for the players too but that's yeah. the rules and we're trying to, to change some weeks but it's, it's very difficult. And the other thing that I expect you'd like to change is this thing with the, with the rankings t talking about going from um, 4 to 485 and things. I mean, Nadal has also said that he thinks that the, it should be averaged out over two years to give, give players that added freedom. Yeah, for me it could be an advantage because uh, I was 400 in the beginning of the year and I came to the tournament and in first round I can play against Federer, Nadal, Djokovic and nobody helped me to be in, in the top again, I just want to be informed to be the best player of the world and maybe that can take a year or, yeah. or less but it's, it's very tough. Yeah. And you have to keep in training all year round, do you basically? Yeah. More or less, yeah. I train a strong, very hard day by day and trying to, to, to make sure the difference with the top players. I love that quote of yours, someone was asking you about winning and so on, and you said, quote, but to win, first you have to know how to lose. What did you have in mind then? What was you? Yes, it's my point of view. Uh, I, lose, I lose many matches and I will lose many matches too. And if you take always the some, something positive of that matches, you can improve your game, your mind, your physical. And it's important when you have the chance to to win a match, to win a tournament, be be ready for do it. Argentina is doing. You've got. You've had a from your own hometown. You've had a lot of tennis players, haven't you? Star tennis players from tennis. Yes, we are five tennis players from Tandil. We are playing around the world. Uh, some ones are playing challengers. Me, I'm playing here, and other ones come to play Wimbledon and. Mm. We are around the world. <laughs> well, good luck all of this week with the, the tournament here and uh, here at Queen's. And, uh, and then we're, what, two weeks away from Wimbledon. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Cheers. My pleasure. Well, Wimbledon is in two weeks, but in just over a month, South Sudan will become the world's newest nation as it breaks away from the north and celebrates independence. But tension has been mounting in the last few weeks after North Sudan invaded the disputed border town of Abia, which is claimed by both the North and the South. The UN says 60,000 have fled the area with reports of burning and looting. This is denied by the North. So could Sudan actually return to all-out war? Well, to discuss this, I was joined, who better than the Sudan's Foreign Minister, Ali Ahmed Kati. Foreign Minister, we, we welcome you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you for, thank you for joining us. Thank you. The headlines at the moment, of course, are all about Abia, and, uh, and the South has declared that the North's op your occupation of Abia is an act of war. Um, is it an act of war? Do you see it that way? No. Unfortunately, you know, people engage themselves with, uh, you know, big uh, and bubbles and, you know, uh, uh, these, these things. This is not an act of war. If you have an agreement that, has not, that had not been implemented in the right way, and you have the responsibility of securing the area and availing, you know, opportunities for both sides of the population to have their access to water, grazing, and everything in that area, what will you do? Will you wait for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, United Nations uh, you know, mission uh, to, to open doors for a massacre, as, as has happened in, in, in Palestine before? Or shall you uh, act to stop any violence in that area? What we did is, the s is stopping uh, violence and stabilizing the area and opening doors for both population from south and north to get down to, the, to their rights of grazing and water. We are stopping 
uh, a possibility of a massacre. We are opening doors for uh, the population to have their rights. We are implementing peace, and we are preventing a kind of unilateral uh, you know, solution from one party. We declare that we will not uh, be there for, uh, uh, for long. We will be there only up to uh, mm, reaching an agreement on uh, the arrangements of peace in that, in that area. But, but at the same time, though, the, um, for instance, um, the head of the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in the, States, uh, in the United States, John Kerry, uh, said something about the two parties, the North and the South, were getting ominously close to the pre precipice of war. But you say not. That's not what you're going to do. That is not war, and nobody is, is, uh, is ready to, to go back to war. We had been in war through decades, and we have seen by ourselves, and uh, we lost so many lives, we lost so many resources, we lost so many chances. So nobody is prepared to go back to war. Look at what we had been doing throughout you know, signing this agreement. We sacrificed some very important part of our country. We sacrifice some very important, you know, sizable number of our population. And we sacrifice so many chances and so many resources in that part of our country. Shall we, after all that, go back to war? For which reason? And the UN have said that this occupation is a serious violation of the peace accord that you signed with the South. It demands, that the, and it demands that the government of Sudan withdraws immediately from the Abia area. Um, so, so that's the UN it's very, very clearly yeah, criticizing what you've it's done. Easy, it's easy to criticize, but uh, nobody can tell me what the UN forces were doing there throughout two months of you know, continuous violations to the agreement and continuous attacks, attacks against it against the population from the north and against SAF, Sudan Armed Forces. Mm -hmm. And even, at last, they were, you know, uh, encouraged to attack the UN forces themselves. What are they going to do there? Shall we wait for them? Shall we wait for a massacre, opening doors for two populations to come and clash with each other? Or shall we act? We are acting according to the law. We are acting according to our responsibility as the CPS says, ABA will be in the north till the time we agree on which future will be on that area. We agree, so we'll it, could, it could, that area. it will not necessarily end up in the north. Yeah, yeah, it may not, it may not, but till now it's our responsibility. Secondly, nobody can tell me that this is an occupation. If, if this is part of my country, yet, till the time we agree upon the future of that area. It is part of our country. And now, not yet, even the South is part of our country. So nobody can tell me that I'm occupying uh, an area where I should be there whenever it is needed, uh, especially if, if, if we have a duty to destabilize the area. Yeah, because, I mean, there have been reports that, that a lot of people have fled in fear uh, when, when you occupied the territory. They were mobilized. I, I tell you, they were m mobilized, you know, and they were scared about, you know, uh, information that the army is coming to kill them, to remove them from the area. They fled. Some yes, of them 60,000. Yeah, no, not at all. I, I tell you, the whole population in that area, from the north and from the south, were, were not at all 60,000 in that uh, specific uh, period of time uh, of the year. How long will, will your troops and so on stay in ABA? How long will they stay? Any time we conclude an agreement on the uh, security arrangements in that area with the international community and with the mediators from the African Union, we are ready. We are ready. Any time. Any time? Any time. If we, tomorrow, if there is an agreement on how they could uh, the uh, arrangements be implemented in that area uh, with an agreed upon you know, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. arrangements, we will pull out. Well, you've said a number of very, very uh, important things, and, the, and two of the basic things that, that you've said to us today um, is, first of all, that, that uh, you, were absolutely, you absolutely plan to withdraw from uh, ABA as soon as there is a clear agreement 
yeah. on what the outcome, the settlement is to be of who owns where, yeah. that at that point you, you will withdraw. And secondly, that in any case that you have not gone into ABA or anywhere else in order to fight, that yes. you've had enough fighting over the years yeah. and that you have absolutely no intention absolutely of getting right. involved in fighting right. again, yes? Absolutely right. Absolutely. Well, that's absolutely clear. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. For three months, protesters and opposition groups have been calling for President Assad of Syria to step down. But their calls have fallen on deaf ears. President Assad continues to cling to power as violence across Syria seems to escalate. While government forces prepare to launch an attack on the city of Jazir al Sugar, um, the international community is preparing a UN Security Council resolution condemning President Assad's attacks on civilians, particularly. I'm joined now by Osama Monajed, uh, a Syrian political activist and a member of the opposition movement. Um, what is the situation, do you think, today that, that possibly, as we mentioned there, there may be a, a Syrian action at any moment uh, against that, at that particular city? Um, in general, do you think um, the Syrian government's position is weakening every day or not? Well, it's certainly the position of the government is weakening of the regime and the uprising is gaining momentum. It's gaining momentum in terms of numbers and in terms of uh, the towns and cities and villages joining. Uh, the uh, uh, regime today mobilized the army and the security forces towards the uh, Jisr al shughur town in northern Syria. I should say that's the same town I referred to, but it sounded rather different when I said it. Yeah. Carry on. And... Uh, the, uh, uh, they burned, uh, unfortunately, the wheat fields. They um, um, attacked civilians, uh, women and children in the uh, area while the tanks were marching or, or proceeding uh, towards the uh, city. Uh, they even positioned uh, uh, rocket uh, and, and missile launcher bases uh, around. It's, it's a war zone against civilians, uh, uh, very utterly uh, uh, inhumane in, in any way. How about Turkey? Are they getting more exercise now about what's going on? Well, for Turkey, it's a national security matter. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it's the southern borders, and uh, you have the Kurds on one side, and the, you know, what seems to be a chaotic situation uh, also on the other uh, sides of the border. They have, uh, you know, uh, thousands of, of Syrian refugees now uh, moved to the Turkish side. Many of them uh, needed uh, urgent uh, uh, and emergency uh, uh, medical treatment because they, the uh, protesters cannot take their wounded ones and, and, and fallen heroes to hospitals because the security forces occupied hospitals and kicked medical staff out. Whoever uh, a protester, uh, any protester goes in, uh, they'll be lost, uh, killed, and then taken to be buried in mass graves. So uh, uh, protesters and wounded in northern areas, they flee to Turkey, and the uh, Turkish uh, Red Crescent they uh, uh, built uh, a, a, you know, tents there and uh, kind of a field uh, emergency rooms to treat the wounds. So it, it is uh, the, the public opinion in Turkey is, is uh, with the protesters and there's a huge pressure on the political uh, leaders in Turkey to do something about it. And, and indeed the people in the world have come do something about it perhaps as well. But in this p particular situation, as of now, it's very difficult because of course there's not uh, free traffic for journalists in uh, Syria or whatever, but uh, how many lives have been lost we have, since this aggression? We have documented more than um, uh, 1,250 names by name uh, and documents, and there are far more, obviously the number is far more, but we don't know about. Uh, more than 10,000 been arrested uh, in, in Comunicado. They turned uh, schools into detention camps, they turned cinemas into detention camps. If in, in some towns and cities, there are no uh, uh, um, high school exams, like the GCSEs or A-level exams here in England. It, it all stopped because they used the schools as concentration camps and the basements of these schools as torture chambers. But at the moment, the reaction of the world has been muted, do you think? I think it's, muted? I think it's improving. Uh, we've seen the language in, the, in Washington. Uh, it's becoming more and more serious and critical towards Syria, more critic. 
uh, 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 critique, and and even in in in, um, in Europe, we've seen uh, in the past few days mm. the French are the first international power to declare that Assad has indeed lost his legitimacy to rule the country, and we were hoping in Brussels in our meetings to that the rest of the European nations to follow suit, and to announce that Assad has lost uh, lost his legitim legitimacy to rule and uh, that the Assad regime is a source of chaos in the region, source of, of destruction, uh, uh, certainly a big uh, problem for the world's peace and certainly for in the Middle East. And were you surprised, as I think people around the world were, that the Syrian regime suddenly appeared so vulnerable? We're used to not knowing much about what goes on in Syria and people don't generally writing about it refer to it as an ongoing regime and it's not endangered. Were you surprised that it suddenly now seems, well, vulnerable? For those who knew Syria and are experts on Syria, they knew what you see on the outside is a facade. Uh, it's a, uh, a, 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 that is a very tightly controlled country. Yes, it is a, 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 a military dictatorship, but yet when you demonstrate peacefully and use it on violent means, that's the weakest thing in the regime and you can kill them in the heart. Um, uh, again, they, they, their troops are now exhausted. The, uh, uh, um, the budget, national budget, they have problems now funding the military and security operation. The main uh, source of uh, funds for the Syrian national budget is tourism, about 24 to 26 percent of the national budget. And now is, this is all zero. The second source is the uh, oil revenues, about seven to eight million dollars a day, which we are trying to uh, also sanction and, and, and impose embargo on. So we dry the sources of hard currency in the country. Looking ahead a bit, um, do you think there's any possibility or a strong possibility that President Assad, Assad will still be in power in Syria at the end of the year? They shot themselves in the foot. When they said Assad gave the order not to kill, and then we've seen in every day and every weekend in particular and every Friday hundreds being killed, then he has no authority. He cannot control his troops and his security forces. Then he has to go because we need to see some form of leadership in the country. And if he o did order the killing, then he's a, a killer and he has to be tried and also stepped down. So in both cases, he's not fit to rule. So uh, I don't think even they, they try in the past few weeks because of their vulnerability and this is one of the biggest signs that they are vulnerable and about to collapse to open and to have a national dialogue to talk to the opposition for the first time ever in 50 almost 50 years they'd recognize that there is an opposition in the country where they were accusing all uh, the opposition members are being foreign agents and infiltrators in the country and now they want to sit on the table of, of dialogue it's again a sign of weakness and this is how the protesters see it with few weeks of demonstrations, they were able to change the government, also it's a, although it's, it's a facade, I mean no one calls for government to be changed, it's the presidential palace who makes the order, but they were ed able to lift the state of emergency, were able to force uh, the regime to do things that no one ever thought uh, we'll see in Syria. So this is how the protesters feels, uh, feel uh, nowadays, empowered, in control, and the regime is in reaction. Well, thank you very much for being with us. That's a very good summary of where the situation is at the moment, and uh, we'll be uh, watching closely to see what the developments come, and so will the news here at Al Jazeera, etc. Thank, thank you, David. My pleasure. Thank you for being with us. Uh, that's all for this week. Uh, my thanks to all of my guests, of course. Uh, do join me again, please, in seven days' time for another edition of Frost Over the World. Goodbye for now.